There are several problems in physics and engineering where a wave encounters a sudden change in potential energy. One example is a classic problem of an ohmic contact between a metal and a semiconductor. An electron incident on the interface between the two encounters a sudden change in potential energy. So if it's propagating, in this case from left to right, it's going to encounter a sudden increase in its kinetic energy because of a sudden decrease in its potential energy. And that's the problem that we'll model right now. The energy experienced by a wave in one dimensional space suddenly changes at x equals zero. It either can go up or down, and so it's either a barrier in potential or a step in potential. And we want to find the transmission and reflection coefficients. A sketch of the potential function shows a sudden change at x equals zero. It has value b0 in negative space and a value zero in positive space. A wave is incident at energy e, and when that wave arrives at the interface, some of it has to reflect because there's been a sudden change in the potential energy. It's like a light wave arriving at a dielectric interface and there's a sudden change in the impedance to that wave. And so some of it reflects back and some of it proceeds through the interface. I'll call the negative region region 1 and the positive region is region 2. And I'll write down the wave functions in those two regions. On the left, in region 1, you have an incident plane wave that is a free particle. And it reflects. It's still a free particle, so it's still a plane wave. So the wave function in the negative region has two plane waves. One is forward propagating. That's e to the i k 1 x. And one is reverse propagating, e to the minus i k 1 x. k 1 is the wave number in the negative region. In the positive region, the wave number is k2, and the wave function is just e to the i k2 x. There is no reverse propagating wave because it's only transmitting through and heading on to the right. Nothing's coming from the left. Let's figure out these wave numbers in these two regions. They come from the kinetic energy of the wave, which is presumably a particle. In region 1, the kinetic energy is the energy of the wave minus the potential energy, as well as in region 2, it's just there's no potential energy, so the kinetic energy is the total energy. So we can write the wave numbers in the two regions. It's momentum over h bar in region 1. That would be the square root of 2m kinetic energy over h bar. And in region 2, it's the same thing, the square root of 2m kinetic energy over h bar. So now we have expressions for the wave numbers in each of the regions. We have preliminary expressions for the wave functions with these coefficients a, b, and c. Let's proceed to find expressions for these coefficients. In order to do that, there are two conditions that have to be met by the wave function at the interface. The first is continuity. It has to have the same value just before the interface as it has just after the interface. The consequence of that, then, is that a plus b has to equal c. Go ahead and write out the two wave functions at x equals 0. You realize you just have e to the i k 0, which is 1, and so ignore it. And you have a plus b equals c. We'll call that equation 1. The second condition is differentiability of the wave function at the interface. Now, you might ask, why does the wave function need to be differentiable at the interface? If you look at the Schrodinger equation, it has the second derivative of the wave function in it. So if the wave function isn't differentiable, whether it's the first derivative or the second derivative, that means the derivative is infinite. And the Schrodinger equation is therefore undefined, which would be unphysical. So to have a solution to the Schrodinger equation, you need to have defined derivative at the interface. And so that requires differentiability across the interface. So differentiate those two expressions and evaluate them at x equals 0. And again, you have these e to the i k zeros that you can ignore. And you have a new expression, which I'm going to rearrange quickly for c in terms of a and b. Put a box around it and call that equation 2. You can insert this expression for c into equation 1 above. And you have a new expression that has only a and b in it. Rearrange this and solve it for b. And you have expression for b. I'll put a box around it. And I'm going to insert that back into equation 2 that we just looked at. But here it is as a reminder. And you have a new expression for c in terms of a. So we have an expression for b in terms of a, and we have an expression for c in terms of a. I will let you do the algebra between this line and the next to last line and convince yourself that's correct. Now you see we have expressions with the coefficients, except that one of them still is unknown. You have a, b, and c, and we have these two equations. You will never actually know all three coefficients without some initial condition. Let's not assume an initial condition that would allow us to solve for all three. There are a lot of questions we can proceed to answer without knowing that initial condition. 
Let's find the probability current. What is that? It's not electric current, but it's very similar to it. We'll even represent it with the capital J for current density. It's momentum over mass, which is the velocity of the wave, times the number of particles per unit volume. Now, if you stare at that long enough, you realize that that's velocity times number per unit volume is the number of particles per unit area per unit time. And it really isn't number of particles, because it's a probability wave. You can go ahead and cross that out. It's actually the probability. So J is the probability current density, which is the same principle as electric current density. And in your quantum mechanics textbook, you've got an expression for current density in terms of the wave function. So go ahead and evaluate this with those expressions for the wave functions, beginning with region 1. I'll go ahead and just plug in the complex conjugate of the wave function expression that we're using and the derivative of the wave function that expression that we're using and so on. I will let you do the algebraic simplification on it and you will come up with this in terms of A and B where K1 again is the wave number in region 1. Now there are two terms here h bar k1 over m and h bar k1 over m and, and then a squared b squared and they're subtracted from each other and remember what a and b really are a is the coefficient of the incident plane wave and b is the coefficient of the reflected plane wave so these two terms are literally the probability current density for the incident wave and the probability current density associated with the reflected wave the algebra for region 2 is a little simpler because you don't have two plane waves to contend with. I'll let you do all of that, and you get probability current density is h bar k over m times the c squared, and that's transmitted probability current density. One thing you notice when you look at these expressions is that j, the probability current density, is a real number, and that's very important. It would make no sense to have a complex probability. To summarize the four equations, then, that we have, the probability current density in the two regions and the coefficients b and c in terms of the coefficient a will keep a as our unknown it's the initial condition plug them in for region one you have an expression of the probability current density for region two you have an expression for the probability current density both of them in terms of this amplitude of the incoming wave a you know something interesting here they're the same when you put b in here and c into here and reduce the algebra, you have the exact same expression. Probability current is conserved. That is just the same on either side of that interface. If the wave hits an interface, some of it reflects, some of it transmits. Let's find the percent that reflects and the percent that transmits. Begin with the reflection coefficient, which is the amount of reflected probability current divided by the amount of incident current density. That's an intuitive statement on what reflection should be. Put in those expressions that we have for J reflected, that's the second term of that region 1 current density, divided by J incident, that's the first term in that region 1 current density. You can cancel a lot of things and all you have is B over A. So this B over A squared is the percentage of reflected probability. Refer to the expression that we have for B in terms of A, and you have a more useful expression. And I would remind you that these wave numbers, K1 and K2, are written in terms of the potential energies in the two regions and the total energy of the particle. So that's the reflection coefficient at the interface. Transmission as well can be found from, the, again, an intuitive statement that the transmission should be the percentage of probability that's transmitted, transmitted probability current density divided by the incident probability current density. Refer again to those expressions for J in region 2 and the part of J in region 1 that corresponds to the incident current. H bars and M's cancel, but you're left with a ratio of K's and a ratio of the coefficients. But one thing I'd point out is it's not just C over A. That's a common mistake made with these kinds of problems, is that the transmission coefficient is the ratio of probability coefficients. But you need to account for the change in impedance to the wave in the two regions. So it's not just C over A squared. Now we have that expression for C in terms of A. Use it. And you have a transmission coefficient is this. I'll let you do the algebra, and again, the wave numbers K1 and K2 are up above for reference. This tests out fairly well. You should be able to add the transmission coefficient and the reflection coefficient together and get one, because the incident wave is divided into two parts, the part that's reflected and the part that's transmitted. The probability of being reflected plus the probability of being transmitted should add up to one. Add those two expressions together, 
expand it out and you'll quickly realize it's one. That's exactly what it must be. So there we have the transmission and reflection coefficients for a potential barrier. You could write it in terms of E energy and V zero potential energy. That's just extra messy, but you could do that with these expressions up here. I won't ask you to do that in the homework problem, but it's not really a problem. It's more like an exercise because I just walked you through the whole solution. Now all you have to do is make one little change. Have that incident wave come from the right, from the positive region, instead of the left, from the negative region. And come up with expressions for the reflection and transmission coefficients. Okay, well after this we'll be able to work on finite potential well.